Last week, uh, the six conservatives, the six Republican appointees on the U.S. Supreme Court weakened what remains of the Voting Rights Act in a six to three decision. And that comes after uh, the conservative majority in the court, led by John Roberts, gutted the other big central provision of the act back in 2013. Those two sections, uh, Section 2 and Section 5, were the most important ways of enforcing changes to voting laws, either before the fact or after the fact, and, and they've both been significantly weakened. Now, the need for federal voting legislation is stronger than ever. There's a question about whether there's any conceivable universe in which some kind of grand bargain on voting is possible, in which Democrats agree to provisions that Republicans have pushed to, quote unquote, protect against fraud, like voter ID, in exchange for a guaranteed floor of voter protections and access. A couple of weeks ago, we saw a glimmer of what that might look like when you might remember Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat of West Virginia, proposed a set of changes to the For the People Act voting bill that did include some voter ID provisions. And when voting rights advocate Stacey Abrams endorsed those changes, her endorsement itself was enough to kill the bill in the minds of Republicans. Which leads to the question, is there anything to negotiate here? Maria Teresa Kumar is the president and CEO of Voto Latino. Ellie Mistal, the justice correspondent for The Nation. His latest piece is titled, Bigots Have Finally Accomplished Their Goal of Gutting the Voting Rights Act. Mehdi Hassan hosts The Mehdi Hassan Show, which streams on Peacock during the week at 7 p.m. Eastern, airs on MSNBC on Sunday at 8 p.m. Um, Maria, let me, let me start with you. I, I, I sometimes think if you could sit down in an abstract universe, you could... <laughs> consider a universe in which you could pencil out a big kind of grand bargain on national voting standards. But to me, the Manchin experience shows that in a practical matter, it's not possible. Do you think that's too pessimistic on my part? No, I, Chris, the, you know, originally you're supposed to have two different parties that come at the, t the table and negotiate in good faith. But we already have Mitch McConnell saying that he doesn't want to support any part of Biden's agenda. Sadly, part of Biden's agenda is to ensure the full franchise of all Americans. And that is what the that's where the rub lies, is that Manchin is trying to continue to negotiate with a body that was very much in that state in the 1990s, but that has dissipated into backing into everybody's quarter. And when it comes to specifically to voting rights, the Republicans have demonstrated time and again that even in certified fair, non-fraudulent elections, they want to gut someone's access to the booth. I'll take Texas as an example. Texas, it's the hardest place to vote. That, full stop, Chris. They are just passing legislation right now to prevent students from voting. Why? Because just among Latino youth, you're going to have a quarter million more eligible voters in time right. to kick Abbott out if we register them. So this is so political. And we're talking about the scaffolding democracy, the little d, not the Democratic Party. And that is where we need more Republicans to come to the come to the table. But sadly, Manchin also has to have a wake up call saying that he has to side with the party in this because we're talking about saving the institution, not his party. Well, and it's also the case, I mean, part of part of the madness here, Ellie, is that because they the Roberts Court in 2013, um, you know, they struck down, they technically struck down Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, but what they did was make Section 5 non-operative, which is preclearance. All these changes have to get checked by the Department of Justice before they go into effect. And, and, and I said before, in the absence of that, then we have all these hand-to-hand -hand combat fights about every change. And, you know, if you read the voting rights opinion about the Arizona case, which was after the fact under Section 2, it's like, yes, like, Maybe there are some small changes that a disproportionate effect that are not um, driven by animus. But the entire point of having that bureaucracy in place to check it was so that we don't have to have these fights. Now that's gone. We do have to have these fights. And I don't think Republicans want us to stop having them, I guess is my point. Yeah, no, I mean, one way, one really important thing to remember about the Arizona voting restriction laws that were just upheld by the Supreme Court is that Arizona admitted that the reason why they were doing this was to influence the election. They admitted right. that these restrictions disproportionately affected people of color. The Supreme Court admitted that these restrictions disproportionately affected people of color, and they all said, that's fine. And why do they say that it's fine? Because they can't win if they let everybody vote. This is the, the, the thing that people have to get about voting rights is that this is actually an existential crisis for the Republican Party.
because if everybody votes, the Republicans can't win. The Republicans have abandoned building any kind of coalition beyond their white supremacist base. So if that white supremacist base is diluted in any way, Republicans have no strategy to expand their base, have no policies to appeal to people beyond their white supremacist base. And so this is like, this is their way. This is their only way to win elections. It's by, it's by, uh, keeping people away from the voting. Well, but let me let me just respond to that and then I'll come to you, Mehdi. But I actually want to I, I think that the Republicans think that about themselves, which I think is it kind of hilariously uh, a, a poor judgment on themselves that they think that. But I also think like, look at I, mean, I keep saying this all the time. Look at 2020 historically high turnout. Right. The Republicans didn't get blown out. In fact, there were four congressional seats in Iowa. They won all four. A few of those were supposed to be tight seats and they kept them. Right now, Iowa's a very white state. But in Iowa, they've done the same thing they've done everywhere. They've rushed to put in these restrictions. The fact of the matter is, it's a fairly competitive party, even under conditions of high turnout. I think they have less faith in themselves than even the outcomes in the election should suggest. Look, I've always said if Republicans could just not be racist for like, four consecutive years. There are a lot of black and brown votes for them, right? There are lots of black and brown people who support like, you know, basic authoritarianism and a police state. Like they could get some votes if they tried. It's that they don't want to try. They don't want to. And maybe that's where where that like that internal self delusion becomes reality. They don't even want to try to go out and get these votes of color. They just want they just want to have to play within the box set by their white supremacist base. And so that's that's why they're doing these things that they're doing well, really effectively. And then when you step back, Maddie, I mean, the, the thing that's upsetting about this moment, and I think you and I are on the same page about the sort of peril and and the stakes here, is that, so you've got this For the People Act, right? You couldn't get Manchin on board, then you get Manchin on board with a compromise, which, okay, fine, Stacey Abrams says, it's great, let's do it. Then Mitch McConnell and all the Republicans turn around and say, oh, it's a Stacey Abrams bill, We we can't touch that. But even if you got rid of the filibuster, as Ellie's pointed out, and you pass this thing, the Roberts court's sitting there waiting in the wings, like, (laughs) absolutely hacking to death. It's like, what are we doing here? Indeed. Let me just address one quick point between you and Ellie a moment ago. And I, I get both sides of the argument. I think Ellie's right uh, that they can't win without uh, changing these rules. You're right that they're more competitive than people think. But look, the key fact is this. It's been 31 years since a Republican president won the White House with the popular vote at the first attempt. Right. That is a right. long time. They know that. They're not stupid. They cannot win the White House. Forget Congress, uh, you know, the House, which yeah. all sorts of gerrymandering, the Senate, which yep. has all sorts of disproportionality. They know they can't win the, the top office uh, very easily. To come back to your point about Manchin and the Senate, I mean, number one, the idea that they're going to reject a compromise because Stacey Abrams' name is on it comes back to Ellie's point. Could they just stop being racist for even four <laughs> days, let alone four right. years? Uh, number two, when is Joe Manchin going to have his awakening? Maria <laughs> Theresa mentioned... I don't know. I mean, I, I've said Joe Manchin's name more times in 2021 than maybe I've said my two kids and my wife's name. I am, like Bernie Sanders, I'm fed up of saying Joe Manchin's name and Kirsten Sinema's name. But I just don't understand when they will get it, what it will take for them to get it. We were told that when they try and do a deal, when they bring something bipartisan and it fails, they will see the light. Well, we saw it on S1 where Manchin got on board with a reasonable compromise. I am no fan of Joe Manchin, but the stuff he offered was reasonable. It was a building block for something better than nothing. And yet he couldn't get a single Republican on board. Even his John Lewis bill that he says is the more important bill than the For the People Act, he has one Republican on board, Lisa Murkowski, as far as I can see. So I don't know when they're going to have their realization. I think the point is that they're never going to have their realization because it's never been about a good good faith argument on their part. Forget the Republicans in good faith. I've mentioned this on the show before. Kissed in cinema in 2010. There's a video, you know, gone viral online. She's saying in 2010, we must forget about the false option of 60. We must use budget reconciliation for good as Republicans did for evil. That's the Kirsten Cinema I agree with, 11 years out of date. So I don't know what it's going to take. One word, one thing I would say, Chris, important, Joe Biden. Let's not let Joe Biden get away with it. Sorry, the president has a responsibility here. It has been nearly four months since he spoke to George Stephanopoulos and said he supports a reform of the filibuster. I've heard nothing from the president since. Where is the bully pulpit? Where is he using his leadership to say, get rid of this filibuster? Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, if if it is going to happen, Maria, uh, and and again, this is where you know, this all comes down to is these these sort of procedural questions, which are actually substantive ones. But if it's going to happen, to to Mehdi's point, and I agree with him, Biden is going to have to take it the reins on it. 
Well, he's also, you know, he's appointed and deployed the vice, uh, the vice president to go from town to town. She was recently in Las Vegas and talking specifically about this. But I will share with you, th we are on the verge of losing our democracy if we do not see Americans talking and calling their members of Congress and filling up the town halls this August and say, I demand it. Because sadly, most of our legislators, they do not find courage unless it's the people talking to them. And this is where we are. To your point, Chris, this, is, this was the largest participation in our nation's history when it came to the voting booth. Why throw that to the wayside? We have an engaged public. Yes. They are paying attention. They understand how the system works. Get them involved because access to the voting booth is one of the few things that Americans across political stripes actually agree with. Yeah, it's true. Well, Maria Theresa Kumar. Um, well, uh, well uh, recently, uh, right? I mean, We've had yeah. we've had we had a hundred years of straight up ignoring the Fifteenth Amendment. Yes, and we have to read recent to actually recognize that the majority of Americans believe it, and that is a starting point. And that is what right. we need I to mean, make sure communicating that opportunity. Well, and the and the worrisome thing here is that that there's radicalization against it, right? I mean, you had the Voting Rights Act, re, you know, reauthorized in 2006 with unanimous vote by Mitch McConnell. Robert strikes it down, and now it's like Susan Susan Collins saying things like, "We don't need federal oversight of elections." It's like, well, yes, we do. <laughs> Plainly, that's an old idea. Maria Theresa Kumar, Ellie Mistel, and Mehdi Hassan. Thank you all.